Yeah, I can't help it. Sparklies. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, up now is John Alexander and Ryan Spaulding. Uh, I'll give you a little backstory on these two. Uh, John is a musician from Chicago known for his uh, pop rock. He often collaborates with other Midwestern artists like musicians Colby Stark and Jim O'Rourke and filmmaker Usama Alshai. He was, also turned, he was also turned his hand to producing, helm, helming a 2003 session for UK punk band The Cribs. Uh, all of this true, obviously. Uh, Ryan is a Canadian installation artist born in Brussels, Ontario in 1957. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Spalding studied at Queen's University where he graduated in 1980. He first gained international notoriety for his audio walks in 1995. Uh, he now lives and works in Berlin. True, right? Sure. A little bit. Please enjoy the presentation. All right. I'm John. I'm Ryan, otherwise known as, as Trace. Well, basically what we're going to be talking about is cameras in general. We like to do a lot of stuff. I'd rather go, like, say, we got a lot of our macro stuff. I don't want to buy someone else's. I want to do it myself. A lot of like hacking stuff, kind of, you know, building your own stuff, and as, as well as making some of the cameras do things they were meant to be doing. Yep, I uh, do pretty much the same thing, just instead of going and buying the specialty stuff, figuring out a way to make it and save some money and still get the same effect. All right, first thing, first thing we're going to talk about is, um, our Holga cameras. Um, it's going to be a pretty basically crappy lens. Um, it's a plastic lens generally. You can get glass lenses for them, but um, focal length you're going to be looking at, at about 60 millimeters, which is kind of about what you're going to see with your, um, with your eye. It's going to give you um, a few focus options. They give you some marks on there. There's like a three foot, um, uh, I think it's like 16 foot and then an infinity mark. Um, but you don't really get to see what you got. Um, you can modify them so they can have a different aperture, but the stock is going to be an f13. There's a couple different masks they'll come with. They'll give you a square mask and more of a rectangular mask. What we like to do with them is actually run 35 millimeter film through it. Um, 120 film is generally harder to get. We live up in northern Michigan and it's not in stores. So we would, you know, get our 35 millimeter and fuse that in there, and it produces basically what's called full bleed. It's using the whole frame, it gives it a cool effect. Um, obviously, you need a camera. ISO 400 film is one of the easiest to work with. It's very versatile. Doesn't need a whole lot of light. Um, for this, it, it works probably the best. Foam packing peanuts, that's going to help it keep the film in place so it doesn't skew all over, but if you want to play around with it, it doesn't hurt anything. Electrical tape is going to help keep our back on the camera because the camera is considered a toy camera. It will actually pop off if you don't. I've actually went ahead and put Velcro on mine because I don't always have a lot of tape. It's reusable and pretty fun. Um, and then unloading your film, you need a dark bag or just a dark room with no light going on in it. Uh, there we go. Okay, if you know you don't have a dark bag, um, wait till it's at night. Normally, find the darkest room in your house. Sometimes it's a bathroom, a room in the basement, preferably with no windows or a window you can cover with a heavy blanket, something like that. That's all you really need. If you go in there and stand in there in the dark for two minutes and you can't see any light, then you know it's dark enough. Um, the other thing with the film, um, you've all seen 35 millimeter film before the size of it. The Holgas are designed to take 120, which is quite a bit bigger as you can see. 
All right, we're going to walk you through the basic steps to getting it loaded. Um, it's kind of confusing the first time you do it. Basically, these little guys right here are going to um, slide up and down. The bass going to fall right off. They normally sit pretty loose, um, and that's why we taper Velcro it up. If you get one of these, get a roll of duct tape and just keep it with you, or uh, electrical tape, keep it with you all the time. You'll need it. The, it's going to come with one spool. Um, if you use any uh, 120 film, you'll have a whole bunch of them laying around. You just kind of push up on it, and it's going to fall right out of there. And then you're just going to put it over here on the right side, same situation. Just push up in there, and it just pops in. Some older Holga models will require you to put something underneath it to keep it from skewing all over. Um, I found mine was a little bit newer, and it didn't have that problem anymore. But the other thing that a new one will have, you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, that piece of foam back there. There's one on the right-hand side as well. Um, get rid of those right away. The glue isn't strong, and it'll get stuck in your film. What you want to do first is kind of set your film in there. You're, you're going to want to run it right across the middle, and then just kind of tuck it in there, get it lined up. Um, it's easy not enough to eyeball it. And then just break your peanut in half, stick it in there like that. Make sure there's a, at least some tension, but not too much, so it's not going to just pull loose again. After that, um, you're going to want to wind it a little bit, and that way uh, it'll have some tension. You know it's grabbing. You don't have to try to pull the back off and check and see that you haven't taken any pictures when you've been out all day. In the back of them, they've got a red window, which is normally for the 120 film. If you leave that uncovered, it will give you spots on your film. But what I've done is just put the Velcro over the top. If you want to hold it up, you can kind of see the back of it. Yeah. Mine doesn't have it on right now since I was running 120 in there, which has a paper backing. Um, so it's got a little red hole. I'll hold it in front of the light here. I'll grab it. But yeah, that way you can kind of see the hole. This red line right here is going to be where you want to run at least one piece of tape. That's going to be a big source of light leaks, um, as well as along the bottom in here. This is going to help keep the camera together, keep light leaks to a minimum. And this is, uh, if you want to do long exposures on the Holga, um, the shutter is just a simple spring-loaded shutter. It's a fixed shutter speed. You, you can't change it at all. So if you want to do any sort of long exposure with it, um, you have to modify it. What I found was taking actually a uh, little nut. I used a uh, motherboard standoff that I just cut off with a Dremel and uh, just epoxied it right above the shutter. It allows you to screw a shutter release in and then be able to do any sort of time exposure with it without having to have your finger on the camera, which would cause camera shake and you wouldn't get a good picture. Newer Holga models have a bulb setting. Older ones will have to be modified, but it's pretty easy to do. Um, like a general application, you're going to want to do anything you want to do a panoramic of. So landscapes are going to work great. It's really fun for group pictures. Um, parties and stuff look really cool. Um, events are even fun too. You got a like big ball game. You can get a nice big strip going. Um, it's really fun for architecture, but it gets rid of a lot of, like, if there's just some, you know, garbage in there, it just makes it a little bit more interesting and makes you look at it a little bit different. And here's some samples. Um, just basic. This one, actually, I kept, I would, I would wind it a little bit, take the picture, wind it a little bit, take the picture. So it's basically one continuous thing of the fireworks, but it would just keep going and going, getting them all in the same one. Same thing kind of right here. Um, really great scenery when, you, when you're playing with them. And then you're going to get into you know, the 120 film, which is also a lot of fun. Black and white developing is probably one of the funnest things I've ever done. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, once you have the chemicals and everything, it's just really great. It saves you money. It's really fun. Um, but it's really artistic. It's, it's fun to play around and do. Um, we're going to go over some of the developing, too. Um, color, film, pros and cons. Color is very easy to have developed. I wouldn't honestly bother with it myself. It's very cheap to just go have them do a develop only, and they'll do that for you. Um, it's readily available. I haven't found a gas station that doesn't have film to uh, buy. It's very hard, though, if you don't have an auto scanner. 
it's hard to color correct. Um, with these full bleeds, a 35 millimeter scanner will not work, so you're pretty much stuck with a flat bed. And developing is extremely hard. You have to have very constant temperatures, as well as a lot of equipment to keep everything maintained. Yeah, with the scanning, like you might have a scanner designed for 35 millimeter negatives, 35 millimeter slides, but if it has one of those little plastic holders that it snaps in, you won't be able to get that full bleed effect where you see the sprocket holes and have the picture going edge to edge. Black and white also has pros and cons. Pros, um, it's extremely versatile. It's easily overexposed and, or underexposed and still can maintain a good picture. Um, like I said, it is very easy to develop. Um, I was able to do it the first time, no one showing me how, and I actually had some pictures turn out. Um, scanning is very easy as well. As long as your scanner can do transparencies, there's very little conversion involved. Um, chemicals can be hard to get. Most stores will not carry them in stock because they've got a fairly short shelf life, so you'd be stuck ordering them offline. Same thing with the film. It's not usually kept in stores. Um, and if you do not want to develop it yourself, it is very expensive to have developed commercially at a photo store. The other thing with developing these full bleed type pictures commercially, a lot of places will want to cut the negatives and you're not doing a standard size, so they won't really know how to cut it. So if you do like shoot on 35 millimeter color film and take it in to have it just developed only someplace, just have them not cut the negatives and roll it back up. Um, that way when you get it home, you can scan it yourself. All right, materials you're gonna need, um, chemicals and such. You're gonna need a developer. Um, most places sell it in a um, concentrated form so you get quite a few uses out of it. It's very cheap. I think I paid $6 for my last bottle and I'm still about halfway through it. Stop bath is optional. You can use water instead if you'd like. Um, fixer is the final step in there. Uh, developing tank, I've got one here um, that uses the metal reels. I will tell you right now, I hate it. I want the ratcheting reels because they'll just screw right on there. You don't have to mess around with anything, but it's very easy. And then you're gonna need a squeegee or a photo flow. That's gonna help eliminate any kind of water spots on your film when it dries. It just helps get the water off from the, the negative. The photo flow is probably the way to go. Um, and you can use both too, it makes it dry even faster. Um, the photo flows basically um, works almost like a soap, it um, changes the surface tension so the water sheets off. And it's like, again, like six or eight bucks for a big bottle that will probably last you your entire life. It, it's like a probably bottle, oh, that big. And you use about three drops. Um, with, if you ever try developing at home, you do have to kind of be concerned about some ecological issues with it. Most of the chemicals are normally safe to pour down the drain. The exception is the fixer. Um, film has silver in it. That's what helps it work, basically. Um, and you don't want to be putting that heavy metal into your sewer system, into your drain field. Uh, you don't really want to poison yourself. Um, so if you save the fixer from when you do it, um, most one hour photo labs will take it in and they'll all have a uh, silver recovery system of some sort that they can dump it in for you and then they extract the silver and they actually get money selling that silver back to uh, industrial processors. All right, with that wording out of the way, we'll go through the basic process. Um, it's gonna be easier if you have an actual, this, I use like a food thermometer. You wanna run it at room temperature, about 70 degrees. Um, it's pretty easy to just mess around with it. Usually the black and white film is very versatile. And if you're not that picky, um, and especially to start off if you're just learning it, you real the black and white is really forgiving about temperatures, times, everything like that. So you can really be way off in what it should be and still come out with some decent looking images. You're gonna to wanna to load your film in complete darkness on the reel. Um, like I was saying earlier, I wish I had a ratcheting reel because you basically load one end in and it twists automatically. With the metal reels, you have to kind of pinch it and then slowly work your way around and if it messes up, you have to re-spool it and in the dark, it's really tedious, but I mean, once you know how to do it, you can mess around with it pretty quick. Um, what you're gonna to wanna to do after you get it loaded into the tank and um, closed up, the tank itself is um, light tight. 
You can pull the top off, add your chemicals. It's not going to expose your film. I'll normally rinse it once just to get you know any debris or anything out of there. Um, after that, you're going to add the developer and agitate it for 30 sec or agitate it every 30 seconds for 10 seconds for around seven minutes. If your developer is different, they will actually tell you on the bottle, give you a better time frame. Yeah, um, and it'll, the time. bottles for all the chemicals you use will have on there their mix sizes. So it'll tell you for this size tank, um, use this many milliliters of water, this many milliliters of the chemical. One thing I like to keep handy too as I'm doing this is three separate buckets, three separate bottles to keep my chemicals in and then put the waste in. That way it's not going down the drain. Um, but then I would dump out the uh, developer after the seven minutes, um, add the stop bath right away, keep agitating it vigorously, um, dump that, add the fixer, same thing, we're going to agitate it for about 30 seconds. I'm um, going to give it a good rinse, get all the leftover chemicals out of there, and then if you've got photo flow, definitely run a, run a cycle with that, same thing for 30 seconds, and use a squeegee, it's going to keep all the water spots off there and it's going to make it look nice. For scanning, you're going to want a, a transparency compatible scanner. A lot of older flatbeds are not compatible with this, so um, when you try scanning, it's nothing's really going to show up too well. Uh, when you've got a compatible one, it's pretty easy as long as you've got a light box. You just lay it on top. It's going to be shining the light through the negative instead of reflecting it off it, and you're going to get all your all your image, all your detail. I like to use a, a nice piece of clean glass to keep everything flat. That way, nothing's curled and it doesn't mess your image up. A canned air was going to help you keep tons of dust out of there because they're really susceptible to dust. You're going to see all the specks on your images. And then a microfiber cleaning cloth to get any smudges or anything off the glass or negatives. Like I've got just my basic rig going right now. Um, light boxes are very, very easy to just make. I use three energy efficient bulbs, a couple pieces of uh, semi transparent plastic, and then just pop it on my scanner. You can see I got a negative right there. The glass holds it down. It just scans like you're scanning a normal picture at that point. Yep. And doing like a homemade rig like that, um, or even using a commercially available light box, which they're like 20 bucks, they're pretty cheap. Um, they're best for black and white film just because it's going to affect the o overall color of the color film. If you're working in black and white, the color really doesn't matter all that much. All you need is a light source. All right, on to our next one is macro. Um, this is by far my most favorite thing to mess around with. This spider, in actuality, is about that big. So uh, using, I, I did a bellows on a Nikon D70. I was able to actually get that close. I think I had to use a studio light to get that good of lighting, but it, it was very fun. Um, different ways to get macro on an SLR camera. I'm not going to touch too much on the little cameras, just because it's, you, know, you push a button and you're good to go. But with SLRs, you get a lot more creative control and a lot more options. Um, filters are very easy, very cheap. Um, you get lens reversal adapter, which we're going to show you about. Um, those are really fun and actually very easy to make. Extension tubes, hit or miss. You can get older ones and modify them to work on your newer cameras. Um, same thing with the bellows. And then dedicated macro lenses, which we aren't going to touch too much on because they're very expensive. And um, it's, it's a lot easier to just to make something. And, but if you have the money, definitely grab one. We use this for our test subject. Um, this is just a straight 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. It shot at 1 320th of a second, aperture of 5.6, distance of 13 inches. Not very good at all for macro. I mean, it's a good lens, but not for this, sub, or this type of photography. This is just going to be a regular plus three filter. Filters are very great, um, but often you lose sharpness if you start stacking them or using the higher magnification ones. The so uh, filters are basically just a magnifying glass that goes in front of the camera with the varying powers. Um, all, like when you look through a magnifying glass, what's in the center tends to be more in focus. What's on the outside starts to blur. You'll see that when you use the, the close-up filters, especially if you stack them because you can stack them. If you have a plus three, a plus four, put both of them on, you get a plus seven magnification. One thing nice about them, though, is they don't require a lot of lighting and normally won't take too much away from your normal lens, but it'll give you a, a good increase. 
Um, this one was shot at 120, 1 125th aperture f9 at 3.5 inches away. This is going to be a reversal ring shot at 28 millimeter. These are really great. They're actually very, very easy to make. Basically what you're doing is flipping your lens around and telling the camera to use it backwards. With these, the wider the angle, the more magnification you're going to get out of it. Um, it's very, it's usually pretty fast. Um, you lose all autofocus settings, but it doesn't require a whole lot of light, about the same amount. Um, and it's also going to be um, just, I don't know, probably really fun. Here's the one you made. Uh, I went ahead, I used Mighty Putty um, to put mine together. It's basically a broken filter and a T-mount. You put it on there backwards, it threads on the lens, and then you put your lens on backwards. One thing you need to worry about, though, is your rear element is exposed, and it's not, very, not as um, durable as the front one, so it will get scratched up. Um, and like what the T-mount is, it's a universal type mount that, uh, it's a universal screw mount on one end, on the other end it's your camera specific mount. Um, you can get them at pretty much any real camera store. Um, they're like 15 bucks. Um, with mine, I did it a little bit different, still use the T-mount, but instead of a broken filter, I used um, what's called a Koken filter adapter. Um, Koken makes a series of square filters that use an adapter ring that you can get in various sizes. Um, and what I did, I, uh, my dad works at a machine shop, so I had him cut the filter ring to the size, the diameter of the actual um, T-mount adapter. And uh, then I just epoxied it on so it's good and solid on there and will hold the lens. Then you just screw it onto the lens and mount it on the camera. Depending on your camera manufacturer, um, some lenses, when they're not hooked up to the camera, their aperture is uh, closed down, that's what mine does. So there'll be a little lever in there that you'll have to hold open and basically just shove something in there to hold it open. Other brands, um, you don't have to do that, but they default to wide open. There's a close up of what mine looks like. Um, so it's got the T-mount adapter glued onto the uh, uh, adapter ring. All right, here's another fun one. Um, bellows are actually pretty common if you're going through flea markets and stuff. Um, mine I actually purchased for about $5. Removing a few screws, I was able to actually get it to work into a T-mount. Um, basically, these are gonna be the most accurate for the macro. I didn't really do anything on extension tubes because they produce pretty much the same results, but they're not as accurate. You can actually load this on a tripod and move it back and forth, and it'll um, be very accurate. Now, you probably won't ever find these for a modern camera mount, so it will require, like you said, going and modifying it to fit like a T-mount or something like that. These require an incredible amount of sunlight or um, like a studio light. Uh, even with the flash, it was at 1 50th of a second at 3.5. Um, nine inches away, it's almost impossible to handhold them. You're going to have to use a tripod and a cable release for sure, but they're going to be very good for doing like jewelry. Anything still life will be great. And then this will be the best. It's also cost the most money. A macro lens itself is going to be um, usually, like this one if in particular, is around $400. Um, it serves a, very well for its purpose. It's a good general lens, but it's very expensive. Um, I think I would get a divorce if I tried to buy it. Um, 1 one twenty-fifth of a second, aperture of four five, and three inches away. Um, just beautiful lens, sharp pictures, um, very nice. But I mean, you can see with the lens reversal rings compared to that, give you really similar results. Spending, you know, twenty thirty dollars on the parts to build it, or spending four or five hundred dollars for the lens to get it. You're going to want to look into a lot of different lighting when you're playing with this. Um, flashes are easy to come by. A lot of them will work manually, even if they're an older flash. Um, I have a few different little options, just like something you can pick up at a thrift store. This will work on a modern camera, no problem. You may have to diffuse it some. Um, diffusers are really nice for the pop-up flashes. These are very, very cheap and um, universal. You can use them on pretty much anything. Or even if you want, you can just throw a piece of paper in front of your flash, yeah. and that's going to work. Piece of paper, um, tissue paper, just tape it in front of your flash. Now, um, pretty much any modern digital SLR, 
an old manual flash like this, you cannot shoot on automatic. You'll have to shoot fully manual. Uh, it won't meter right through it. Um, but they will still work and still fire, so you can use them. Reflectors are a great way to light subjects outside. Um, very easy to get a hold of, even if it's not a true reflector, poster board, um, car shades. Yeah, like the uh, you know silver-backed car shades you put up in the car window. You can find them at the dollar store sometime. Um, those actually work fairly decently as reflectors. Uh, you run into white, silver, gold, depending on the color you want to have um, reflected on your subject. Um, strobes are going to be studio flashes. These are going to be pretty expensive. Um, they're going to take a lot more setup. It's not quick and easy like I would, I would want it. But I mean, in a studio setting, if you have the money, it's great. Same thing with hot lights. Um, only major downfall to these is, unless there are some pretty good ones, they're very hot. If it's a small room, you're going to um, be roasting in there. OK, this gets into kind of my favorite part. Um, digital cameras are all sensitive in some form to infrared light. Film, normal 35 millimeter film isn't. They make special film that is, but that's hard to come by and difficult to work with. Um, with the digital infrared, for like an SLR, um, you can buy filters for it. They're $60 on up. Uh, let me get mine out here. Um, you really won't be able to see it, but it's an extremely dark filter. Looking at it in normal light, it looks like it, you know, it's completely dark and you can't see through it. But if you hold it up to a really bright light, you will be able to see a little bit through it. Um, how it works, it blocks out all the visible light spectrum that you can see. Um, it only allows the small amount of infrared through, and that's what you use to capture the image. Um, so for a SLR camera, one of these is pretty much the way to go. Um, but if you have a small point and shoot camera, you can still do it. Um, it's easiest if you have a little camera like this that uh, doesn't have a lens that pops out. Um, using uh, two pieces of exposed 35 millimeter film, like the stuff you get when you get film developed at the beginning or the end of the roll, that uh, is all black. You put two of those on it in front of the lens and just tape them on there, and it'll work as an infrared filter. If you have a lens that comes out, you can use like a pill bottle cap cut out, something to hold it on the front of the lens. So here's a shot with this camera just of a field by my house. Um, this is the normal, and then this is under infrared conditions. Um, with infrared, any sort of greens, um, like foliage, will reflect the infrared light. And it'll show up as white. Um, you need to have it on a tripod. You have to do, since you're blocking most of the light, you have to do an extremely long shutter speed. Um, bright, sunny day might take a 10 second exposure. Um, either use a remote or the built-in camera 10 second self timer, because if you're hanging on to it for that long, you're going to have a little bit of camera shake. Um, like it says on there, vegetation's the best. Um, and if you don't do a manual white balance setting in your camera, all the grass and foliage, everything, will show up more as a reddish purplish tint. But if you point the camera at grass and do your manual white balance correction, it will set that to white, and then it'll look like it did in the previous picture. Um, with remotes, you can buy remotes for cameras. Um, depending on where you are, they might be easy to find, might be hard to find. Some model cameras, kind of like the uh, mid ones, not the entry level, not the professional, but what they call the prosumer cameras, they can charge a lot for the uh, remotes. Um, for my camera to buy the actual Minolta, which is now Sony remote, they want to charge like $60 for a three foot remote. Well, the uh, connection on it, it's just three pins. Um, one is a ground, one is a uh, setting for autofocus, the other for the actual shutter. I found that if I took a uh, connector for an old CD-ROM audio cable that some of you may remember having to use in the past, which is four pins, um, cut one of the pins off, the spacing between the pins is just right to fit into my camera. I had an old Canon remote laying around that I used as my switch and uh, just connected the wires up, figured out which ones were which, and uh, now I use it as my camera remote. 
Um, the other one that John made, um, he actually just went and got some switches, um, and his camera uses a headphone style jack, uh, which for stereo headphones, right channel, left channel, ground. Um, so that gives you the three different connectors that you need, and then he just made uh, a couple buttons and mounted it in an Altoid tin. So he's got his focus button and got a shutter button. But then using that with infrared, I did this through my SLR, um, but you can get some really great results with it. It's, it's fun to play with, it takes some time. Um, there's a lot of sources online on how to do the conversion. Um, it just, it takes a lot of practice. It took me probably a year to be able to pull off stuff like this. Uh, the other thing that we've been playing a lot with, um, you may have seen a lot the flip video cameras. Um, they started off as disposable digital cameras, um, designed to be used once, and then taken in, developed, sent back to the manufacturer, they clear them off and send them out again. Well, there's guides online on how to convert them to being non-disposable. The only thing you have to watch out for, newer versions of them won't work with this, so you need to try to find an old one. Um, most of the ones, like if you find one at like, let's say a Ritz camera somewhere, um, they haven't carried them in a while, so if you find one there, it's gonna be an old one. Uh, CVS carries them, a lot of the ones they have there are gonna be newer, and you'll have a hard time getting that to work. But they're, you know, you can find them in a lot of places still. Um, they're really easy to modify, reuse, they're cheap, so you don't have to worry about breaking it, dropping it. Um, their quality's not great, so you play it on an HDTV, it's gonna look like crap. But uploading it to YouTube, they look fine. Uh, we've went to a concert before, took them in. You know, you try to bring in a video camera, they're probably gonna stop you. Bringing in one of those, they're not gonna question it. It just looks like a cheap little camera. And, you know, cheap enough that the kids can play with because they're 30 bucks. Um, the other thing we found with it, uh, you, there's, we found an underwater housing that's like a $10 housing that works great. Uh, just this little Pelican 1010 case. This will also work if you get one of the flip video ones. Um, they're not quite thick enough, so just put a little piece of foam in the back of it. And uh, you put the camera in there, it lines up the lens, and uh, it'll work underwater. I don't know how deep you'd really want to go with it, but just swimming around out on the boat, it works really nice. There's the, with the camera in there. So obviously you'd have to start it before you put it in, um, but then just start it up, put it in, you get 20 minutes of video, so plenty of time to record something. And then pull up what the video looks like from that. Here's one I shot with mine today. I don't think it's underwater, but it's at a water park or something. Uh, I think this one's uh, Sturgeon Bay. Okay. So this waterproof housing, great to take to the beach. That way you just don't have to worry about it getting wet. This one, the quality got um, downsized a little bit. I, ha I didn't have it on this hard drive, so I had to read, um, get it from YouTube. Uh, they're out in the water, underwater. This wasn't the greatest example. I couldn't find where some of my better ones were. Um. <laughs> yeah, but so you can take it to the beach, not have to worry about it. It can get wet. And you still actually get a little bit of sound through it, too. Um, obviously muffled inside a hard plastic case, but you can still hear. Um, 
if you do want to try doing it yourself um, with one of those disposable cameras, um, if some of you might have had an old like Palm M100, M105, uh, the cradle for those is actually the same connector that these disposable digital cameras use. Um, so you just modify it. It's got the pin diagrams online. Um, we'll show you how to connect a, just a regular USB cable to it to make it work. There's software you can get online. Um, we just actually found it again today and reinstalled it to download some of these. Um, this one's a little bit different. Um, where I work, we've had these units and they switched them out and we're throwing away the old some, so I managed to snag some official ones, but it works with the palm cradles as well. Um, that is going to be pretty much it. Did we have any questions? Yeah. When you're making the infrared filters from the under unexposed film, I mean, do, do you use the stuff that never saw anything, or do you put it up against the floor and take a picture? I mean, how do you make those filters? Yeah, when you're making the filters, you're going to want to um, have the film that's been fully exposed to light. You want the stuff that's just completely black. Go like this. Yep, go and like that it. if you want to make them. Um, the other thing we haven't tried yet is uh, doing that to a roll of 120 film and using it on just a regular skylight or infrared or skylight or UV filter. Do the same thing for a uh, digital SLR. I just haven't tried it because I've already bought the filter and I might as well just use the one I bought already. Any other questions? Yep. Whoa. Let's grab the mic here. <laughs> that way we can hear it all. I was actually just playing with developing uh, black and white film. Um, you were talking about the chemicals. Um, you mentioned one of the ones that lasts longer. Was that the developer? Um, the photo flow solution. Well, that one. That one. You yeah, that said just you know that's right. a surfactant. Was um, well, you don't reuse it. It's mm -hmm. just you use, it comes in, it was like a couple hundred milliliter bottle. Right, and you only used a couple drops. Yeah, you use like a couple mm -hmm. drops. So you buy it and you're probably never going to develop enough film to use it all. And then um, the fixer and the stop bath and the developing, the developer solution, um, how quickly do those expire? Um, developers are normally a one-time use thing. Mm -hmm. um, stop bath, again, I bl you can use that a couple times. Um, mm -hmm. The fixer a couple times. Um, you just have to basically do it for longer and longer. Mm -hmm. um, the stop bath you don't even have to use. I normally don't use a stop bath. You just have to run a whole bunch of water through it. Sure. But when you buy the, the chemicals and open the bottle, how long do they last before they... Um, after they're opened like that, um, anything past about a year from when you open them, they're going to start to go bad. Mm -hmm. um, they should also have some sort of expiration date on it for when they're unopened. Mm -hmm. um, but once you open them, figure no matter what the date is, if it's been a year, they're probably going to be too weak now. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, I didn't really have a question about the scanning setup that you had, but I was wondering whether LEDs, we made an LED light box at Resistor, and I was wondering whether the light source from that might work better than an incandescent or fluorescent uh, light box. As long as it's diffusing well and you're doing mm -hmm. black and white, it, I don't think it'll make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think it'll really depend on your scanner itself and how right. it reacts to that light. Sure. So it's going to be a case-by-case -case scenario depending yeah. on the scanner. I'm looking forward to trying that out. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Oh, um, I almost forgot about this part. How I do most of my scanning, um, I have a really old, like 10-year-old Canon scanner that's just worthless because it's a uh, rubber belt feed and it's not accurate anymore. Um, so what I do, I take my light box and I actually tape my negatives to it. And then what I do, I set it up across the room, set my camera up on a tripod with a big, mac I have a big zoom macro lens. I just take a picture of them. And that, that works just fine for a basic scan. Um, you know, just get as close as I can to magnify it fully, uh, take a picture of it, and there you have your digital file. Um, so that, I found that that works actually really well, really simple to do, easy to switch out between the, you know, to scan a bunch of stuff quickly. Here, I'll just give you this one. Somebody was telling me the other day that the Epson, I think it was a 4990 scanner, it has a built-in light box in the back of it. It's about a 4800 DPI resolution. Does a really nice job of scanning film at about film resolution for like 150 bucks. Yep. 
Yeah, for the $100, $150, dollars range, you can find scanners that have the right kind of light box needed to do the full bleed, the 120 scanning. Um, so, you, I mean, you can get a scanner for under 200 bucks. That'll do it. Mine actually was a dollar on eBay. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is an HP model that got discontinued. Um, it got horrendous reviews because it has an automatic um, photo feeder on the top. It, everyone hated it but I was just gonna use it for transparencies and it's 4,800 DPI. So it, it works amazing, it's a great scanner and I, I love it. All right, any other questions? All right, thanks a lot for coming out and seeing us. Hello. Anyone wants to come and check out any of this stuff? We got it up here for a little bit and see what's going on. <laughs>